Today I want to look at a generalization of the mean known as the power mean. And what's really good about this is it allows us to prove a huge family of mean inequalities all at once. Okay, so let's look at our definition. So as long as p is non-zero, we can define the pth power mean of these positive real numbers a1 through an by m sub p of a1 through an is equal to the sum of the pth powers all divided by n raised to the 1 over p power. Now let's observe for p equals 1, we simply get the average. So this is something that should always happen anytime we're generalizing something. One like special case of our generalization should be, well, whatever we're trying to generalize. And well, the power mean is kind of obviously generalizing the average. So keeping that in mind, we should also be able to retrieve some other well-known means. And in fact, we can. And probably the next one we should check if we can retrieve would be the geometric mean. And in fact, the way to get this is a little bit tricky. It's actually the zeroth case of the power mean. But up here I said that p was not equal to zero. Well, that means that we're gonna to have to take the limit as p approaches zero, and that's how we'll define the zeroth mean here. Okay, so let's maybe make this claim. And this claim, well, it's exactly what I've just said in words. And I'll just say that we've got all of these positive real numbers, a1 through an, we have, well, the limit as p goes to zero of, well, the p power mean, so mp evaluated at a1 through an is, well, like I said, their geometric mean, but let's recall that that is the nth root of their product. So let's maybe make sure to point this out. This is the geometric mean. Okay, good. So we were able to kind of easily retrieve the normal average, or in other words, the arithmetic mean, and this allows us to retrieve the geometric mean. Okay, so in order to do this, I'm gonna introduce a little bit of notation. I'm gonna set this equal to m sub zero, and then the a1 through an will be understood. Okay, so let's maybe see how this might go. So we're gonna start off by taking our m0 and well, write it as the limit as p goes to infinity of the pth mean, but we'll write out what that definition of the pth mean is. So we'll have this sum a1 up through a n, and those are all raised to the p power over n, and then we've got that all to the one over p. And now unsurprisingly, this is an indeterminate form because actually if it weren't an indeterminate form, we could really just define it without a limit. Well, that's not totally obvious, but I think that's like kind of clear. So what type of indeterminate form is it? Well, let's notice that ai to the p is approaching one as p approaches zero. So I think that's pretty clear because anything to the zeroth power is one. And then one over p, well, that's pretty clearly approaching infinity. Okay, so what does that mean? That means we have a type of one to the infinity, which is an exponential indeterminate form. And the way to handle exponential indeterminate forms is by using L'Hopital's rule after taking a logarithm. So let's take a logarithm. So we've got the natural log of m naught is equal to the limit as p goes to zero of, let's see, we'll have the natural log of a1 to the p added all the way to a n to the p minus the natural log of n over p. So that's by using some logarithm rules. And now we still have an indeterminate form. Notice as p goes to zero, the argument of this natural log goes to the natural log of n, but then we're subtracting the natural log of n. So now we have an indeterminate form of type zero over zero. 
But with an indeterminate form of type zero over zero, we can take the derivative of the numerator and the denominator. In other words, we can apply the standard L'Hopital's rule. Okay, so let's take those derivatives. So we'll have the limit as p goes to zero. Well, the limit of the natural log will be zero. The limit of p will be one. So we just need to worry about this limit of the natural log of all of this stuff. So by the chain rule, the argument will go to the denominator. So let's write that in. We've got the sum of the pth powers. And then, well, notice that p is our variable, and we've got to use the rule for a derivative of an exponential function that has a base that is not e. So the derivative of a1 to the p will be the natural log of a1 times a1 to the p. And likewise, the derivative of a n to the p will be the natural log of a n times a n to the p. So we've got something like that. But now, do we still have an indeterminate form or not? Well, like we discussed up here, all of the ai to the p will approach 1. So that means like, for instance, this term will approach 1, the next one will approach 1, all those a1 or ai to the p will approach 1. Same thing's happening in the denominator, but adding them all up in the denominator will give us an n. Okay, but then after that, well, we've taken care of our limit as p goes to zero. So that simply leaves us with one over n times the natural log of a1 added all the way up to the natural log of a n. But now we can apply logarithm rules to get the natural log of the nth root of a1 multiplied all the way up to a n. So that's like taking the sum of logarithms and smushing them together into a log of a product. And then we've got the exponential rule as well. But now let's see what we've got. We've got the natural log of our limit is equal to the natural log of the nth root of the product. But now exponentiating both sides gives us exactly the result that we need. So in other words, yes, we can achieve the geometric mean and it's via this like zeroth power mean defined via a limit. Okay, so now let's look at another interesting limit and that would be the limit as p goes to infinity. So we've just shown that we can get the geometric mean via a limit and we can also get maybe two things that we don't consider means but are extremes via limits as well. And that is the maximum value as well as the minimum value. And so we'll prove one of them and then the other one will be really similar. So we'll show that the limit as p goes to infinity of the p mean of a1 to a n is simply the maximum of all of those numbers. And similarly, if you let p approach negative infinity, you get the minimum of all of those numbers. Okay, so let's see how this goes. So we're going to, without loss of generality, assume we've got an ordering on the numbers a1 through a n. This just allows us to like do the calculations a little bit easier. So without loss of generality, let's assume that a1 is bigger than or equal to a2, which is bigger than or equal to a3, and so on and so forth, down to a n. And rem remember that a n has to be positive here. Okay, so now let's look at our m sub infinity which will be this limit as p goes to infinity of, well, this object over here. But I'm gonna actually factor an a1 to the p out of the numerator. So let's see what that'll leave us with. We have a1 to the p factored out of the numerator, and we'll be left with one plus a2 over a1 to the p plus a3 over a1 to the p added all the way up to, let's see, a n over a one to the p. And then that's all raised to the one over p. And then let's see, in the denominator, we have this number n. But now let's observe that we can factor this a one to the p out and take its pth root. And that simply leaves us with a one. And then we'll be left with the limit as p goes to infinity of, Let's see, we've got one plus this quotient a2 over a1 to the p added all the way up to the quotient a n over a1 to the p. This is all over n and then raised to the one over p. 
And now let's see what's going on here. So the inside of this parentheses is actually approaching some number, but it's a little bit unclear what number it's approaching because it depends on if this is a strict inequality or not. So if this is a strict inequality, then all of these will be going to zero because a2 over a1 will be less than one and then all the other ones are smaller. But if this is equal to a2 or a1 is equal to a2, then we have another copy of one here. But all of this is kind of okay because all we really need to know is that this is within some sort of set of finite numbers and it is. So like I said, if we have strict inequality, we'll simply get one over n for that limit because all of those will go to zero. If we've got equality just at one level, we'll get two over n and so on and so forth. If we've got equality at all of the levels, we'll get n over n. So that's what's happening within those parentheses. But Check it out, as p goes to infinity, this one over p will be going to zero. But that means we've got just some number raised to the zeroth power, which will give us one. And then multiplied to this a1 will simply give us a1. But then by our choice up here, a1 is the maximum. And that, well, finishes what we wanted to show here. Okay, so next up what I'd like to do is prove an inequality involving these power means, which will immediately imply inequalities about maybe more commonly known means. So in order to motivate our final result, let's recall the inequality of the so-called Pythagorean means. So the harmonic mean is less than or equal to the geometric mean, which is less than or equal to the arithmetic mean. And so the harmonic mean is the power mean where P is equal to minus one. So I've written that over there as M minus one. As we showed before, the geometric mean is the power mean with P is equal to zero. And the arithmetic mean is clearly the power mean where P is equal to one. And so that sort of motivates the following result. And that is if P is less than Q, then the Pth power mean is less than or equal to the Qth power mean. That's like I said, what this is hinting because negative one is less than zero and zero is less than one. Okay, so we're gonna focus on the N equals two case here. It's pretty easy to like extend it, but I think maybe we'll get a good view of what's happening with the N equals two case. So that means that we'll show the following, that a to the p plus b to the p over two raised to the one over p is less than or equal to a to the q plus b to the q over two to the one over q. And that's if p is less than q. But let's notice that this is equivalent to the following statement, where we'll define a function f of x by a to the x plus b to the x over two raised to the one over x is an increasing function. But I don't really mean a strictly increasing function, I mean a weakly increasing function. So sometimes that's called a non-decreasing function. And that's because this strict inequality here gives us a non-strict inequality here. And recall that we get equality for these means if and only if, well, their entries are equal to each other. Okay, so now let's do a similar simplification trick that we did before, and that is assume some sort of ordering on our numbers A and B. Let's maybe go ahead and assume that A is bigger than or equal to B. And so let's notice that that turns our study of f of x being increasing to an equivalent study of, well, I'm gonna write f of x as a times one plus b over a to the x over two 
raised to the one over x is increasing. Well, that's actually not changing f of x. That's just like rewriting it a little bit by factoring an a out. But notice that's if and only if this new function is increasing that I'll call g of x. And g of x will simply be one plus c to the x over two raised to the one over x with c between zero and one. So let's write this, is increasing. Great. So that's like a little simplification procedure on the function that we're working with. And well, why does that work? Well, that's because if we've made this choice that A is bigger than or equal to B, that means that this object right here is, well, less than or equal to one. So perhaps I should have like a bracket here. We are allowing equality. Although the case with equality is not super interesting. Okay, but let's recall that a function is increasing if and only if its derivative is bigger than zero. Or in the case that not, we're talking about something that's non-decreasing, which we're actually interested in, we'll say that the derivative is bigger than or equal to zero. So this is if and only if g prime of x is bigger than or equal to zero. Okay, well, so now let's take the derivative of g to see what it looks like. And I mean, this is just like using the chain rule a couple of times and the derivative of an exponential function where the base is not e. Okay, so anyway, so we'll start with the natural log of one plus c to the x over two times one plus c to the x over two raised to the one over x. That's like the derivative of our outside function where we've got like all of this stuff to the one over x. Now we've got to take the derivative of the inside function, which is one plus c to the x over two. So that'll end up leaving, leaving us with, let's see, the natural log of c times c to the x all over two. And now we can study the size of all of these. So let's note that this object right here is definitely bigger than zero. It's definitely positive, just given that c is bigger than zero. And then, well, let's notice that this natural log of C object, maybe I'll uh, circle that in red, is actually less than or equal to zero. That's because C is less than or equal to one. Oh, but then if C is less than or equal to one, then the argument of this natural log is also less than or equal to one because we're like essentially averaging it with two. So that makes this less than or equal to zero as well. Oh, but then all that's left over is this c to the x over two, which is clearly bigger than or equal to zero. So in the makeup of g prime, we have two terms that are definitely positive and two terms that are definitely less than or equal to zero. But putting that all together, we see that all in all, we've got an object that's bigger than or equal to zero. But if the derivative is bigger than or equal to zero, it means our function is non-decreasing or maybe weakly increasing. But then recall that if g was increasing, then our function f was increasing, but then our function f being increasing essentially gave us that our mean inequality held in this n equals two case, which was the case that we were interested in. So if you're still around, thanks for sticking around. And if you haven't subscribed yet, maybe consider subscribing. It would really help out the channel. And that's a good place to stop.